what is your experience with it in the research you've done? How is social media impacting women? How is it impacting the work environment? What's your kind of thoughts on this, Kristen? <laughs> I could take up another five hours talking about this, but um, it's an important conversation, I believe. Yeah, and particularly, um, there's a lot of research, and I'm not going to go into it right now, around the impact for girls, um, particularly young girls at a more impressionable stage. And the level of filters we're using, not just on the physical, I could say on how someone's skin or body looks, but just a filtered life, a filtered lens. It's any social media is generally a highlight reel. Um, and so one thing I do endeavor, although I haven't been strategic about it enough yet, is you know, on certain platforms, I want to tell more stories of failure and overcoming failure and what that looks like so we can normalize some of these things in a powerful way. One of my goals also, like you, um, you mentioned like what kind of impact I want to have. And I was mentioning that, you know, there's this whole concept of, you know, um, aspiration directly being linked to visibility, like, and the fact that you cannot be what you cannot see. Well, if all we see are these kind of curated you know, um, influencers, I mean, sometimes I don't even know what they're influencing, but then we're doing a disservice to the next generation of young women. And I would love to highlight some more of the stories of women that are making bold moves in different ways in their careers and lives that are really admirable. And again, aligned with kind of a value set that resonates. Um, I think the, the positive, um, I've talked a little bit about the negative is that there's created a platform for more entrepreneurs and Often women, um, if you look at trajectories, um, are at home more than men in terms of caregiving roles. If we look at the gender balance at home, um, if we look at elder care and social media and the virtual workplace in many ways has created more access to people and networks than would have happened um, just working a nine to five that's presence driven. So in certain ways, it's equalized access more, which has been really interesting. But there are so many pros and cons around this and around how we show up in the world in different platforms. But I think the biggest thing is creating content that delivers value. And I always say to myself, like, I, you know, you're looking at these, uh, you know, Instagram photos of certain people and is this creating value? And not every post needs to, you know, be something that is like life shattering. It could be just you sharing something you're doing in your life or whatever it may be to make it more human again, show the woman behind the, the bio. But again, it goes back to my why, the impact I want to have. And I always try to ground in, is this going to impact people positively? But um, I wish we could have more of that lens. I wish we could have more discussion around really the negative narratives and impact of overly curated highlight reels on younger individuals in particular. Well, and of course, if you've done it, well, you would have done the research, but you know, there's certainly a lot of evidence and it's basically a known fact about how the algorithms work and how they show up and really how they play to whatever is going on in your world, given not only what you say, but what you're watching and what's coming across your feeds. And, and it just gets fed. It's just, it blows my mind that, you know, that's what's really going on. And it's, uh, I think it was, I want to say it was Joe Rogan who has got young daughters or a young daughter, one of his sick, one or his kids, whatever that might be. He actually read all of the stuff around TikTok. And he read all of the terms, the conditions, and all of the things. And uh, he read it out loud. And basically, it is mind-blowing what they draw, not only from you directly, what you're watching or seeing on TikTok, but what other apps you're using and what you're doing within those apps. So it is so, it's such yeah. an intertwined world that he's going, and my my kids are, I'm letting my kids do this TikTok thing. And I'm going, no, I'm pulling you off right now. You can't use your phone anymore. It's, but then he's realizing that this is what is, and it's how things are unfolding in the world and the impact of social media, to your point, because we're you know talking about women and, and particularly uh, the impact on young women and, and the self-esteem part of that as well. I can't imagine, I just cannot imagine going to school today, given text messaging and phones and all the things that happen, you know, we talk about bullying in the old days, it was somebody came up and pushed you down. 
you know, the bullying today still has that, but right now the bullying is about what can happen on social media, the, the how quickly a message spreads. And I really have a lot of compassion for the kids and what they must be dealing with in school today and the parents that are having to navigate all of that. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's some great work and resources out there for parents to around this, but it is scary. And it's scary how much everything about our lives are trapped. I mean, even um, with the, with abortion legislation in the U S you know, the discussion around women shouldn't use ovulation trackers on their own phones because then there's some other party being aware of anything and you shouldn't search things. And, you know, this is getting to, to me, um, it's not just about technology, it's about bodily autonomy as well. But I think that there's such an intertwining um, toxic area for people in terms of at what what what's private for us anymore? Um, I do also want to just touch upon you know body image, and this is not you know anything in my book or anything like that. But I've always you know had an interest in that. And when I was a freshman at Brown, I wanted to look at the impact of media at the time, not even social media, on because it was TV, right? So on um, on women's body image. And I said, it's so hard because we can't measure what it was in the US pre media and TV show and post. So I said, I need a counterfactual where I can control for that variable. And I found this study of women in Fiji and the fact that before media, Western media coming in, you know, um, the women of Fiji, it was celebrated to be larger, to look ch- like you can bear children. There were all these cultural things. And then there was the integration, I think it was like the early 90s of Melrose Place and Heather Locklear and all of these Western standards of beauty and how the trajectory of those reporting with eating disorders and body dysmorphia and all of these other things went up. And so for me, this was like almost like a Petri dish experiment of let's sprinkle in this one variable and control for it and look at it that I studied at that you know young age. And I, I still remember that because now we're not just talking about a TV show you turn on and turn off. You're talking about endless opportunity to access data and such filtered data and images. Um, so it's something we all have to be aware of as, as we talk about being bold and taking risks. It's you know how do we normalize certain things and then call into question some of the data and images and things that, that are projected to the people in our lives. So is there a message, you know, as we start to wind down a little bit, um, I don't want to step over anything. And I want to, from your perspective, you know, when you look at what you've done in the research, writing the book, the work you've done, the work you do with individuals or organizations, is there a, I don't know, a thread of commonality of things that women do or don't do that you know, you see as a, as a repeat, something that you would say, you know, be, be aware of this or be aware of that. Is there a common thread that you would want to share? Yeah. So I definitely don't want to paint <laughs> all women with one brush and I've seen lots of variation, but I have seen certain trends in the women that I work with and have researched and I, I will share those with you. And one is uh, reiterating what I said before, waiting to feel confident or ready before taking on something that feels scary or with a risk of failure. And, and, and I think that that actually stalls a lot of individuals. Um, another is um, thinking about risk in very limited terms. It's only if you're an entrepreneur, it's only if in finance, it's only, these are often male terms. I mean, risk could mean advocating for someone else in your workplace, you know, raising your hand in a meeting if you're afraid of speaking, you know, offering to run a proposal or a team meeting. So I think that that this more expansive view of risk is something that I've seen a real need for. Um, another thing that and I just actually ran a session for a global Fortune 100 company today, and I was talking about the fact that a lot of women feel like they have to have all the answers and they come into networking situations thinking I need to have something to say. They come into negotiations thinking they need to have something to say. And really one of the most powerful things is not what you have to say, but what you have to ask. And actually flipping that script and focusing on curious questioning helps people deal with some fears and hesitations. 
Um, and just, I guess the, the final thing, I mean, I could list off so many, but just the reminder that we're not fixed, we're fluid, we're malleable, we're ever changing and ever evolving and committing to continuous improvement and growth. That has to be a lifelong journey. I think sometimes we think there's an end point or that next shiny object, or I'm going to feel better once that book's published. And and then you start thinking, oh, this is what I could do better. This is what's next. So um, just that understanding. um, And finally, I'm just going to say like, have faith in your capabilities to figure it out. Marie Forleo, who, uh, you know, is an entrepreneur in her own right said, wrote this book, Everything's Figure Outable. And I really think that life becomes a lot easier when you think, you know what, irrespective of the outcome of this, I will be able to figure it out, even if I have to pull upon different people to support me or resources or ask the right questions. So those are the things that I think I've seen as trends and kind of the opposite actions I really hope they take. <laughs>